All right, final video for chapter two. Last one was getting a little long, so I decided to split it up. Um, so let's look at the one-to-one -one function, f of x equals the square root of x. Um, if you're not convinced it's one-to-one, -one, let's just peek at the graph really fast, right? X, square root of x looks like this, and then we're just gonna shift to the right one. Remember, x's are opposite. Um, so we'll start at one, and we'll shift. Right, and it's one-to-one. -one. It passes that horizontal line test. Um, so let's find the domain and range, and we can use that to find the domain and the range of um, the inverse function. So what's the domain? Um, maybe we can see from the graph that x is bigger than 1 or equal. Um, but if we didn't graph, remember inside radic radicals, it has to be greater than or equal to 0. So x is greater than or equal to 1. So that's my domain. How about the range? Um, I like the graph again. Um, and notice that the y values are greater than or equal to 0. Um, so that's my range. Um, comes from the idea, right, the output of square roots is always um, positive or 0. We call that non-negative. You've probably seen that word a couple times in the book. So that makes my range greater than or equal to zero. And so now we can find the domain and range of f inverse. They just switch. So the domain of f inverse comes from the range, except it's the x values. So x will be greater than or equal to zero. And then the range means that the y's are greater than or equal to one. It's all about just inverting, right? They're just opposites. So let's actually find the inverse to confirm all this is true. So. Our original function is y equals square root x minus 1. We're going to go ahead and switch them to make an inverse. So x equals square root y minus 1. And we'll solve for y. So I recommend squaring both sides to get rid of the square root. So x squared equals y minus 1. And then we just add 1. So my inverse function is x squared plus 1, but we have to use this domain where x is bigger or equal to 1. And I'll show you why with the graph. So we had already graphed the original function, just copying it over. And then my inverse makes that nice reflective property about y equals x. And you'll notice it really only makes half of a parabola. And so the left side of the parabola disappears. And that's because by including the left side, right, it's not one to one. And the square root didn't really have the, left, the other side, right? Square roots kind of cut, get rid of that other side. So it's really important to pay attention with domain and range with inverses. And the graph really helps. By looking at that reflective property, you can see that it really only makes half of a parabola and not a full parabola. So graphing helps a lot. The shapes should be the same, right? So this can't be a full parabola when this isn't. So graphing helps a lot. Um, and I just have one final example, and then hopefully we can get lots of practice out of the book to master this. Um, so sometimes we'll restrict the domain as well from the get-go. So we didn't have to restrict the domain here, um, right? Because f of x equals square root x minus 1 was 1 to 1. In this next example, this is not a 1 to 1 function. So sometimes when we have functions that are not 1 to 1, we restrict the domain so that we can find an inverse. So x squared minus 1 would be x squared, and then we just go down 1. So make sure you're getting better at those transformations so we can graph things fast. Um, notice it's not one-to-one. -one. So as of now, if I find an inverse, it's not going to work. So what am I going to do? I'm going to maybe only use half of the graph. I think the most common thing is probably to use the positive side. So I'm going to restrict the domain to only the positive side. So to x greater than or equal to 0. 
Um, I'm not asking for a range, but just to review, the range would be y is greater than or equal to negative 1, because the lowest point is negative 1, and y is always bigger. But we don't need that. But why not refresh on it a little? So let's go ahead and find the inverse. As long as we restrict the domain, we can find an inverse. So y equals x squared minus 1. Let's go ahead and switch them. And let's solve for y. So I'm going to go ahead and add 1. x plus 1 equals y squared. And then this is where we get the issue, right? The square root and the square root. Um, the square root of x plus 1 is the square root of x plus 1. But the issue with the square root of y squared is it equals the absolute value of y. And plug in numbers and you'll see what I'm talking about. 3 squared is 9. And then the square root is 3. But what if I do negative 3? Because I'm squaring it, it turns into 9. And it also, but then when I take the square root, it's back to 3. So that's where this idea comes from. And so that is where we get the idea that y equals plus or minus the square root of x plus 1. So a lot of us might probably skip that middle step, but that's where it comes from. When we square root of y squared, that's where we get the plus or minus. And so this is not one to one, right? Because now we have two choices. Um, and that is why restricting the domain made this work. Because we restricted the domain, we only need the positive case. And if we didn't do it, it wouldn't work. So y equals square root of x plus 1 from the restricted domain. And that's because y is greater than or equal to 0, right? Um, if the domain of f is greater than or equal to 0, then the range of f inverse is greater than or equal to 0. So that's why you can get rid of the negative case. And so because we restricted the domain, this works. And a square root function makes sense, right? It's going to make this nice reflection about y equals x. And again, we're only looking at the orange piece, and this piece goes away. So if your function is not one-to-one, -one, just get rid of half of it by restricting the domain. So go ahead and get a lot of practice out of the book. Let me know if you have any questions.